Good morning, everybody. I'm gonna to call to order the board of directors meeting. Today is Wednesday, June 30th, 2021. We are online. The meeting was noticed prior to the governor's order releasing the meetings. Did I say that right, Kate? <laughs> All right, so good morning. I'm gonna take roll call. Heather King, here. Suzanne Spellin. Here. Jeanette Nicholson. Here. Andrew Cooper. Here. John Cubitt. Albert Watson. Here. John Carmelo. Here. Christina Maribel. Patricia Riley. Brian Barker. Okay, I believe we have enough for a quorum, correct, Kate? Just enough. How many board members do you have in total? Uh, Six. No, I mean on the board. Eleven. Yeah, here comes John Cubitt. Okay, John Cubitt is here. Okay, we have a quorum present. Also present, we have Tony Tazi, Executive Director, Kate Hedgman, our esteemed counselor at law. And is this also Julia is here with us? Yes. Okay, and anybody else I'm missing, Kate? Not right now. All right. Well, good morning, all. Good morning. We, we have a, we have quite a bit. We have two topics of discussion before we get into resolutions. The one of the one of the resolutions, well, do you want to adopt the meeting minutes first or and then go into discussion or might as well. Yeah, we okay. usually jump into minutes first. All right. So let's do the minutes first. And we have only the March 28th or the April 28th meeting minutes, right? Yeah, we did not have a meeting in May. All right. So did everybody have an opportunity to review? Do we have a motion to approve? I'll motion to approve. All right, Andrew, do we have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, now let's get to the fun discussion stuff. <laughs> All right, so Tony, Tony's gonna talk to us about, there's two items up. The Legacy City Access Grant, just to give an overview. Tony did send a, a Word document out, also giving us some inf background information on this. And also there's gonna be a letter of discussion, a letter of support to the city. So the meeting agenda did say minutes or a resolution with that, but this is not a resolution. So that's why I kind of bumped that up after the discussion of the legacy city access grant. So I'm gonna turn this over to you, Tony, so okay. you can. <clears throat> so uh, some, some folks know about the, the uh, legacy city access program, which is the uh, $25 million uh, funding opportunity only for land banks that the governor's, governor's office announced, uh, I believe it was June 17th. So, um, this is a first come first served kind of uh, grant. Um, the way the grant works, um, it requires land banks to partner up with developers. Um, New York State Housing and Community Renewal seemed very strongly to be, <clears throat> to be wanting to see land banks partner with minority uh, developers or minority contractors that can evolve to become developers. Um, the grants are very generous. Uh, they're 75,000 per dwelling unit, uh, but they can go up to 95,000 per dwelling unit if there are energy efficiency uh, work done in, in, the, in, in the particular units. Um, HCR is looking for land banks to assemble bundles of property and the bundles need to be between five and 10 properties per bundle. And each building has to contain one, two or three residential dwellings. Um, there's not a whole lot uh, of money in this for land banks. Essentially the, the financial piece of this for land banks <clears throat> is whatever the land bank negotiates with the developer for acquisition of the properties maybe holding costs. There is a uh, developer development fee of, I think it's 12%. That could be part of a negotiation. Um, but essentially once the, the land bank um, closes on these properties, it's really the developer that takes the ball, <coughs> pardon me, and runs with it and um, 
really um, has most of the funding because obviously they're going to need it to do the buildings. There's also uh, a requirement that the land bank and the developer um, part, um, work with um, a, a home ownership education training. Um, in our case, it's TRIP. Uh, also, a landlord <clears throat> training uh, program. Again, TRIP. They've got obviously they've got terrific programs. Um, when the developer is done with the buildings, he he or she is required to sell them to owner occupants who uh, have to live there for ten years. If for some reason they move out, it's a sliding scale penalty that they'd have to pay back. Um, so that's that's a very quick overview. Um, I'm I'm working with the city to try to develop two bundles of five bu buildings each. Right now, I'm um, up to eight or nine. Um, Steve Strykman has been working with me on that. Uh, he just came back from uh, sailing the seven seas. So um, we once I know what we have in terms of building bundles, then. I think what we should be doing is posting to the website um, a request for letters of ex uh, expressions of interest. Um, and part of that will be asking developers basically, okay, what's your experience, what's your expertise, so that we can do an evaluation to see who would be the best partner or partners for us to uh, get together with. Um, it sounds like it's going to take HCR six months to review each application. So this is not something that's going to happen quickly. So if we do get these bundles of properties from the city, we're going to have to, uh, there will be carrying costs, insurance, property maintenance, and whatever else. Um, so that's that's the overview. And I, and I did send out a Word document that kind of started off as notes to myself on a strategy on how to bundle, um, bundle buildings. Um, I think there are five, maybe six that we're looking to get from the city that would qualify. Um, but we're also getting back 785 River Street and 836 River Street, which qualify. 3209, 3211 7th Avenue, which we should be getting back any day now, um, does not qualify because it's six units. Um, it's kind of too bad that wasn't that didn't have two addresses, or two two parcels, but it doesn't. So we could probably maybe ask to split it. Um, well, I thought about that subdividing it. Um, uh, you know, it might be worth just talking about. I, I think it'd be a long path to go down. Just but I, could, it I could be two? wrong. Yeah, but I could be wrong. Because two attached three units. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what it was originally. Actually, eight thirty six River is part of the. Six unit building. Yeah. So, uh, Suzanne, do you see that come up before on the planning board a bit? No, 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 not in my experience. I mean, people have divided lots, sure, but uh, they were usually, they've always been just land and not buildings or land and a building. Be worth <laughs> asking the question to see how that could be done. And then maybe that could, those, that would be generate two more. That would, because I believe it was initially two at one time that was merged into one. That would get us where we need to be. Um, I have a question. Sure. Um, would one developer take five, take a bundle, or is it parceled out smaller than that? A uh, developer could take a bundle of five to ten. So for, for us, if we were if we were able to get. Uh, Say two bundles of five buildings each. We would, uh, we really would have to work with two developers okay. because otherwise it would be considered one bundle of ten buildings. <clears throat> but so, if it's two developers, then it's two bundles of five buildings. So we're looking for people who are capable of doing more than one building. Yeah, that's that's kind of a key to this whole thing. It, it seems to me uh, very much that a, HCR is looking for a very successful program. You know, this is a new program for them. So uh, um, so they're, I think they're really looking to see developers um, who can really demonstrate the ability to juggle um, several buildings at once. So these developers aren't necessarily gonna be contractors. Um, they could be, 
but um, I think the thinking is more that they're they're basically going to put the financial package together you know professionally done um and um they'd probably well they could gc it themselves or they could hire someone uh to gc each building um or all buildings however they they want to put it together um i suspect that as we're putting an application together and even after an application is put together and submitted that HCR would probably um, have a conversation with us to um, kind of make things um, make the picture look more like what they want it to be. Um, I, I don't think the first time in it's going to be, oh, this is this is great. Let's let's give Troy some money. Uh, but I'd love to be wrong. <laughs> that that was my question: is how clear are we on exactly what sort of criteria they they're looking for in this whole program? To, they're well you know like to put our bundles together what do we know what they what those should really look like they we do in a way in a way um so a lot of land banks have asked them to define to define certain um statements so one of the things that's required is that the properties be in close proximity to each other to, to be more impactful which makes sense so when actually when i ask can you um define what um close proximity is uh, they just they didn't really answer the question but I, I think the overall the thing that they're looking for is whatever your footprint looks like the smaller the better so and that's kind of another reason why i think two bundles of five would be better than uh one bundle that's you know maybe a little bit more than five um uh, another piece to this is Seven Park Avenue, which we have um, teed up at for, we have programmed it for demolition. Uh, Russ Reeves provided me a letter um, to support the need for demolition, but as he handed it to me, he said, you know, Tony, this building really isn't too far gone. It, it, it definitely could be uh, uh, rehabbed. So, uh, so my thinking is, well, you know, maybe, uh, maybe we want to reprogram that. But that building also ties into the RPI Habitat um, TAP and uh, Land Bank Initiative. Uh, we were going to demolish that to create a larger um, redevelopment area that Habitat was going to build a couple buildings on that RPI was going to design and TAP was going to be the architect of record. Um, there's still basically a double lot there where at least one building could still be constructed. So. Um, I, I think that's something that perhaps A and D needs to talk about some more. We did a little bit, um, but I, I just would like to know how solid A and D is on Seven Park Ave. Um, if Seven Park Ave is part of it, then um, you've got Seven Park Avenue, Seventeen Park Avenue, um, Thirty Two Glen Ave. I'm trying to think what else is in there. Um, well, that 3229 6. Oh, that, uh, yeah. So then you bounce over to, to uh, 6th Avenue and you've got 3229 6, 3236, which are directly across the street. And then I think it's 3420 or it might be 3436 Ave. Um, and then 785 River and 836 River. And uh, we think we can get 16 Dow Street from uh, from the city, but I'll, I'm not positive. I'm, I'm waiting to hear back from uh, Steve Strickman. I did just go look real quick at 3209, 3211, and it is it was two lots that were merged at one time. Hmm. Two fit there. Um, it's 100 feet front, 100 feet back, and they are 250 feet at one time. Yeah. So I think that would bear some further discussion. To split that maybe to two three units. So this this will be a pretty long process. Who's in the end? Who has oversight over the? I mean, whatever all the the requirements and restrictions are of. I mean, even this. So the sales, the the eventual sales, even from the developer to the to prospective owners, like. Because they're supposed to be owner occupied, and they're, and and what do you say it was ten years of occupancy, and 
Yeah, it's just, I'm, I mean, I, that may not really matter so much for us, but I was just curious. It's like a, a long-term process. Well, I, I, I don't think it does matter so much for us. I think the developer um, has the burden of most of the HCR regulations. Well, the way it really works is we put a covenant on the property along with the other restrictions so that it has to meet all those requirements and conceivably we could take it back. We'd have to still be paying attention however far down the road, right? Well, <laughs> um, yes and no. I mean, yes, in the general sense, but the covenant that would go on runs with the land so if that piece of property was to be uh, flipped to anyone, um, sold, you know, that covenant goes with it regardless of owner. So it's really enforcing the restriction and then HCR slash um, enterprise who's requiring that covenant, um, they could take action if it doesn't meet it meet those requirements. Well, enterprise won't be part of this. I, I don't believe so. Oh, right. I'm thinking of NCST. I apologize. But still, same okay. concept. HCR. Yeah, yeah. It's HCR's covenants. Um, and they would run with the land. And it allows them to enforce that covenant, regardless of who owns it, for a period of 10 years. So I, um, I also have uh, gotten Hillary Lamashaw involved. Um, can't think of a better person to help put, put a grant together. Also, Teresa Newton um, was initially going to also be involved. But uh, when we realized that the financials really have to be put together by the developer and not, you know, not someone else, um, that's usually what Teresa's um, strong suit is. Um, so she, she basically said, Hey, I'm Harry, if you need be, but it sounds like you probably won't. So, um, so we haven't gone too far down the road again, because we need to know what buildings we're working with before we can, um, start talking to developers about, Hey, do you have an interest? And if you do, um, what's your background and expertise? Um, I think once we know the buildings and once we have an idea of what partners we want, then we can start putting together um, a pretty solid application. But it's, I think it's premature until we know that. Or at least hey, that Tony, it, uh, are, is there a, um, an active pool of smaller developers that we could presumably tap into? That's what I'm uh, trying to hunt down now. Um, I'm, I've been given some names. Um, and some sound pretty promising, but ACR is also working with uh, CPC, um, what is community, CPC, Community Progress Center, oh. I think. Um, and they actually just started, well, so, so they can be a help on two fronts. They just started uh, a program called Access Program, which I have a feeling is where the Legacy City Access Program comes from. Their access program is about nine months long. It, it is um, primarily intended to take minority contractors or developers by the hand and help them evolve to the next level. Um, they also said um, in this Zoom meeting that HCR and CTC conducted together that if, if communities don't have developers available, that they have a very long list of developers that they can uh, share with us. Oh. What so. they what they seem with this grant to be forgetting <laughs> is we have to we can't just pick a developer. We'd have to put out a request for qualifications at least yeah. or an RFP, um, you know, to to make it fair. Um, I think in this scenario, it would be worthwhile to post something in the Times Union, you know, notice notice of uh, the bid opportunity, you know, cast a wider net 
Um, I've, I, you know, there's a few organizations that are out there as well that may help get us um, exposure to an audience of MWBEs um, that we can certainly circulate it to. Um, this is really where community partners come in. And I think Seat and or um, Roberta could really be on this and in getting the information out to different organizations who also have a listserv that goes out to their constituency. Um, I, don't, I don't know that we've done a great job in making those connections and having people help us promote, but Roberta should certainly, you know, um, take a look at that. And she, she's aware of it, and um, she and Virginia are have promised have promised to do that. Okay. Oh, great. So we'll see. Okay. Is there any other questions? I think I've any more information, but I think that's pretty much the overview. Oh, I have a quick question: Is it seventy-five to ninety-five thousand? Per living unit or per building? Per dwelling. Per, per building? Unit. Per, per unit. unit. Okay. Yeah. So it's pretty right. hefty. All right. And uh, I, I should say HCR has made it clear they're not looking for someone meeting minimum code requirements. They're looking for what they call quality affordable housing. So um, I think they'll glean that out of whatever um, specs and drawings that the developer pulls together as part of an application. So um, uh, Jeanette, I know that you'd be happy to hear that. Yes, I would. <clears throat> yeah. I'm happy too. <laughs> oh yeah, so, so am I actually, so. I am too. <laughs> <laughs> um, just for the record, I wanted to note that Christina Marable did come into that. the meeting. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Jeanette. Okay. So do you want to talk about this um, letter of support? Yeah, um, so there was a New York Land Bank Association monthly meeting last Thursday. And um, so what's always part of the conversation is where, where is their money? Um, with the American, what's, what is it called? The American- Rescue Plan Act? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there is there is money there that can be uh, allocated to land banks um, and and other uh, folks that do um, affordable housing. So um, what I circulated was what Albany County Land Bank uh, sent to their perspective. I guess the, uh, Albany City of Albany has a committee um, assigned to make recommendations on how th those federal funds should be allocated. And um, uh, if I remember the letter, Adam and other co-signers have requested that 20% be set aside for affordable housing. Um, that letter is um, pretty much exactly what uh, Syracuse drafted. And Syracuse was successful in getting that 20% set aside. So the general thinking among your among the New York Land Bank Association members is if we all kind of put together the same letter and make the same request <clears throat> and point to Syracuse and then hopefully point to Albany and then point to another city or county that provides a 20% set aside, then it's going to make it a little bit, uh, a little bit difficult for other communities to say no. So what I'm, uh, what I'm thinking of doing is taking the Syracuse boilerplate letter, which you saw in the forum of Albany, and um, uh, revising that for us <clears throat> and submitting it to the committee that Troy has established. And I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not even sure who's on the committee uh, or who I would send a letter to. I just haven't gotten that far uh, to, to know. But, um, but I wanted to let the board know that. Um, also, um, Albany partnered with uh, two other organizations, with Habitat and um, Sue Cotner's group. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm not sure whether we should send a solo letter or if it would be <clears throat> better for us to, you know, talk to Unity House, talk to TRIP, talk to other community-based organizations 
<coughs> Pardon, guys, <coughs> to get more signatures on such a letter. I suppose it's better to have more than less. Does Troy have a community land trust? No, but I would think <clears throat> trip is is obvious. Unity House, oh, I really lose my voice. That's a shame. <laughs> uh, Unity House CEO. Um, I'm not sure a tap would be appropriate signatory, but um, there are other groups out there in Troy that uh, might be interested to sign on to, uh, you know, a letter like this, and they may already have been uh, drafting one themselves. So how do you guys feel I should go with that? Is this a, a vote on a resolution? Because well, I, I wasn't was a, clear. Because it says yeah, resolution, no. right? <laughs> it, it, this is just a discussion, Andrew. I, I initially um, put resolution next to it. And then uh, after talking to Kate about it, it's like, well, there's not really any action that's required. You know, Tony can write a letter. Um, but I, I didn't want to submit something if the board was opposed to it or um, if the board had ideas on how you'd like me to move forward with it. I assume you're not opposed to it. Well, I read the letter. I'm I'm all for it. Yeah, I, I, I mean, the only I think details of content to, could yeah. be discussed, but I think it's a good idea. I mean, I, you know, and I wouldn't, I don't know that I would say what or who should or shouldn't be included. <laughs> so, so I guess go for it. <laughs> I think if you can get some partners with the letter, I think it just strengthens it. But I'm I'm in support of you putting that out. Yeah, me too. I think it's a okay. good idea to have um, folks interested in affordable housing on board. And there are certainly <laughs> enough of them in Troy that... Yeah. Um, is Troy Housing Authority part of that as well? Or can anybody apply for this, Tony? Um. I, well, out of what the city is. Oh, I guess not, because it has to be a land bank, right? Well, no, no. This is, um, th these are the federal funds. Uh, oh, okay. Fr from the American Rescue Act. Ah. So they're, I, I think they're really up for grabs. The, the, um, the criteria um, is fairly broad, uh, although there are some restrictions. Like the city can't, the city can't create a, a, um, um, a fund balance and their budget with it. It's it's got to be spent. They they can pay themselves back for losses accrued because of COVID, but they can't create a balance fund. So they you know basically have a piggy bank. Um, the federal government doesn't want to see that happen. Um, but otherwise, it's it's a fairly broad um, you know allocation. How much so, is the uh, city of Troy getting? Oh gosh, what is it? Is it 36 million? Yeah. Is that the number? Something like that. And, uh, Is this the 43 million that we're talking about? It could be 43 million. I thought there was a four in there. Yeah, I they, think it's 43. Yeah. When are they making a decision? As far uh, as that, the, I don't I don't know that, um, but I obviously I need to find that out rather quickly. Um, I I know that they create the city has created a committee. Um, but I don't know who's on the committee and I don't know where they are, you know, down the path of uh, consideration for, for funding allocations. All right. So we got to find out who that committee is and yeah. you got to reach out to some potential partners. We'll have that done today, right? <laughs> Sorry, it's already done. <laughs> yeah. Uh, tell me, does Steve know? Yeah, I'm sure Steve does. So, um, you know, I was, well, we were all together in that sweltering <laughs> ribbon. I know, yeah. Yesterday. I thought it was hot as hell. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I actually grew up back to City Hall. I just didn't think to ask the question. So, um, but it's easy enough for me to pick up the phone and talk to Steve. So, or to email. So, okay. Um, I didn't hear anyone say no. Um, I'll try to reach. Uh, reach out to other potential partner partners to, to sign such a letter and uh, we'll see where it goes. 
Uh, I just have one other thought, which is, do we know that no one else of those potential partners at this time is writing a letter that they want us to sign with them? <laughs> well, that, you know, that's, no, I don't know, but that, that could be how this goes. Um, right. You know, I might pick up the phone and talk to Christine to trip and she might say, yeah, hey, we've already got something drafted. Or she might say, we've already drafted it and submitted it. So um, that's something I, I think I'll learn once I start calling around to ask folks if they, you know, want to partner up on signing the, the, the letter. Yeah, uh, let's say that another Troy organization is submitting or has submitted an application for this. Uh, is there any thought about I, I mean, what, what do we do then? I mean, do we? I guess our letter could turn into a letter of support to uh, the letter. <laughs> uh, okay. <clears throat> so that's in the background there. It could be a letter of support as opposed to. Uh, well, that's just what my, my response is just now to, you know, your question. Um, hadn't thought about. But yeah, I think that we, I don't see why we couldn't do that. I can't believe it with um, a pot of money available in the city of Troy that we would be the only ones um, with an ask letter, but hey, um, maybe we'll get lucky. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll find out what's out there and I'll uh, shoot an email around just so everyone's in the loop. Hmm. Okay. I mean, this letter really basically just says that affordable housing is necessary. Can you, um, put aside from money specifically for that. It doesn't really get into details as to who should get it or what they should do with it. So it's pretty open-ended. Yeah, and I think, I think that was probably strategic uh, by Syracuse. Um, I don't think they wanted to pigeonhole any, any organization. Um, you know, I think it's pretty obvious if there's a set aside, um, you know, the obvious um, hardworking community-based organizations are going to get part of it, which I would hope would be something we'd be considered as. Well, let's go for it. <laughs> yeah, can't hurt, might help. Okay. So we have three resolutions on the table today. The first one is this revised property transfer list from the city to Troy Community Land Bank. There's a resolution and these are the properties that are part of that, uh, the bundling that Tony illustrated. Uh, there is one thing that I did notice in the resolution is that the date is July 30th, 2021. So Oops. I'm going to make a motion to revise the resolution to reflect June 30th, 2021. Okay, sorry about that. I'm gonna put the resolution on, on the table for discussion. Is there any discussion? Can I? Um... Yes. That, that list initially had 16 Dow Street on, and then I heard uh, from City Hall that that was not available for us. But Steve Strykman yesterday told me he thought it was. So I would request that we put 16 Dow, um, add that to the list. And then if it's available, you know, that could be a good thing. If it's not available, the city simply will not transfer it. They'll amend their resolution. Um, or they'll make a resolution, whatever they, they need it to be. All right, so I, I'll make a motion to modify the resolution approving the acquisition of properties to include 16 Dow and also revise the date to June 30th, 2021. Second. Can we get a second? I'll oh, second. second. <laughs> okay, so Heather King, I vote yes. Suzanne Spellin? Yes. Albert Watson? Yes. Brian Barker is absent. Andrew Cooper? Yes. Jeanette Nicholson? Yes. John Cubitt? Yes. John Carmelo? Yes. Christina Maribel? Yes. Patricia Riley is absent. By the way, uh, just for the record, Brian and uh, Patricia both said that they weren't not they, in advance that they wouldn't be able to make the meeting. So. Okay, all in favor? 
Aye. 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 No opposition. Okay, so the next resolution that we have in front of us is the disposition. The A and D reviewed the application for 3154 Sixth Avenue and is making the recommendation to the board that we transfer, that we sell the property. This is a vacant lot. And this is to QIMA, Q-I-M-A, LLC for $3,000. So I'm going to put this on the table for discussion. It wasn't the purchase price $1,000 in the document? Initially, and then we countered, and this was the... Yeah, well, the thing that I reviewed yesterday still said $1,000. Um, the resolution has 3000 on it. Okay, just... Yeah, just, but I think, yeah, I, I see that was the initial... What Kate, what, what we usually do is after there's formal action taken, they have to, you know, make whatever corrections to their application, and Kate fuses that to the uh, enforcement note. Okay. Do we have any questions? Yeah, I oh. got one. <laughs> yeah. They got ten thousand dollars to complete this project. It's a three hundred thousand dollar, well, four hundred thousand, three fifty, whatever. I it's see they got less than ten thousand, so they only got like, they only have like four thousand dollars because they got like two thousand in a business account. So it's contingent upon a mortgage, upon getting financing, and when they go to meet that contingency of the contract, I review it again and make sure there's enough cash. You know, they're going to have to come in with X, I'm sure, you know, on whatever loan they're going to have. Um, and if they can't meet that uh, budget, then, you know, they haven't really met the contingency. It doesn't even look like they have enough to close. Right now, I mean. Yeah, I mean, we can ask them to show more cash availability. Um, but I think, you know, if they're going to borrow, most of it would be, um, what's it say for the total cost of the project? Did they even submit that or no? Uh, that's, yeah, they, they provided a very robust. Yeah, 350 to 400. All right, so they probably need at least 35,000, you know, for... Well, it's 85%. You really can't look at the value, the dollar amount. You got to look at the what they request. It was 85% of the appraised value. So 350 or 85%, whichever is less. So. Right. So 10 to 15% in from the developer plus closing costs. You know, you're, you're right you know, uh, Albert, but, you know, I guess that's their burden to meet. I mean, we could, I suppose, table it and ask them to show they have those funds because you're right. If, if they don't, then. Why even do it? Yeah. <laughs> well, don't they have to own, I think there's some steps. They have to own the land, which is they're acquiring from us for $3,000. Then they have to go and they have to get some variances. So they have a few different steps that they have to meet, is that before they even apply for financing? Because there's a lot of these contingencies involved. But I believe well, they've met the burden to purchase for $3,000, is that correct? Well, the thing is, we don't actually close that sale, Heather, until the mortgage contingency has been met, all, okay. the all the government approvals, title, you know. Um, okay. So, you know, yes. Albert's point is well taken because normally they would need to show that, you know, they've got the capital to, you know, meet the loan requirements, right? Yes, they have um, an additional 15 plus closing costs, et cetera. Right. And they're not going to go for government approvals and all that until they've met that contingency. So, you know, um, I will tell you, I am familiar with the lender that they're utilizing. It's Who actually is one it? of, it's uh, the National Bank of Kiksaki and it is oh, one okay. of my clients. Yeah. And they are wonderful. Yeah, but and that's they are not, very conservative. Do you do, do you do business on the commercial side with them? 
I am not a commercial appraiser. I do business on the residential side, but I know they're all the commercial people too. If it's a straight line commercial loan, I don't know if it's SBA backed, I doubt it. Um, then, you know, Albert's the, right. You're going to, you're going to need 10 to 15% of the loan value. There, here, go up to the commitment letter. So, and I believe well, they finance I mean, for it, new construction up to 89%. Right. So that's, that's where I was going with like 10%. So they, they they're in for 35,000 right there, plus closing costs. So, you know, it might be, you might approve the sale contingent upon showing available funds to complete the project. I mean, that's what I would recommend. I support that. Me too. Uh, I don't have anything against that. I, although I, I feel like if they're, since we have our enforcement and if they have a plan um, that for the development that we think is consistent with, you know, our, our approach uh it's great then I'm let sure. them you know unless there's someone else that wants to buy this lot right now that we think is better <laughs> i kind of <laughs> like, was of the same i i like, mean i i i agree i mean andrew i agree with you and then i also like it's um i also agree from elber's point of view it's like here we go you know are we gonna this is a hefty undertaking and i want to see them there we go well, the reality is the bank isn't going to give them the financing unless they can, unless they can meet that That's uh, burden, right? That's my whole point, yeah. So normally how it works is you're right. We go to contract, we let them try to meet that burden, right? And if, if the financing fails for whatever reason, then we all get out anyway. Um, so... You know, and, and Heather, I don't know whether it was just a description you were giving, and I'm picking up on some nuances, but if they expect to purchase the property outright, not contingent upon anything, we're not doing that. Oh, no, we can't do that. Yeah. Um, okay. No. Yeah. All right. Because okay. you had said they have to own the property, and they really won't own it until they've met all their contingencies well, I and think, closed. I, and I know the Bank of Kiksaki will... I'll work with them. I'm looking at the commitment letter. This is, the, I believe this is the residential department. So because it's a one to four unit and I'm looking at the rate that they have. So it's consistent with their construction to permanent program they have. Right. So either there's, you know, that they're going to need to show the bank that they have those funds. If they can show that those funds are available to us um, prior to entering into the contract, we certainly could do that, but they'll never meet the contingency unless and until they do. So sometimes I think when folks fill out these applications, they don't think that way, right? So they put probably put down, you know, that they have ten thousand dollars in cash. I don't, I don't know what that means, but we certainly can ask them. That's not a um, that borrower is a, is the real estate holding company. It's not that's not a residential commitment letter that's a commercial commitment letter because it's made out to a um, real estate holding company is it made out to q i m a yeah i think I yeah. yeah yeah that's the llc that's purchasing the property so that's not residential that's commercial yeah it has to be unless okay. Unless they're residential loans, they can, like Heather said, they can do up to four units. And so they keep, they keep everything in house. So they do things a little differently there. Yeah. Yeah. But I, but I'm not going to say anything else. But even <laughs> if it is residential, um, you know, that's fine. But they're still going to have to jump through all those hoops of the contingency. I think it'd be one thing if we had another applicant, but we don't, you know? So I think if you want them to show us more funds before entering into the contract, we could certainly ask for that. Um, and if they don't, for whatever reason, you know, I don't, does that change wanting to move forward with it? Well, I'm just questioning, can they do it? That's all I'm, I'm just looking at everything we got. I'm just questioning if they can do it, that's all just reasonable complete the project that's all 
Well, I feel that this particular lender who they're going through their financing is very conservative and they do their due diligence. So if we allow them to go through their, through their process, obtain the appraisal, determine if the funds are there, if the, they'll go over the construction plans, they have to obtain everything and rely upon them to determine if it's a fiscally sound project. I would defer to that. I'd be Tony, comfortable. Tony, are they aware of the 100% AMI? Um, well, it's written into the application. I'm not, okay. I'm not positive that they clearly understood what it, that they read it or that they understood what it means. Yeah, I, because they have to be able to make the numbers work and show on their pro forma to the bank, the rents that they're gonna proposed rents, they're gonna charge. Um, so, you know, I, I guess I just wanna make sure too that they understand that there's all these restrictions and, you know, the bank is going to want us to subordinate our covenants and everything else to their loan, which we normally will do, we can do. Um, but, you know, making the building numbers work, you know, is going to be important to a loan of that size. So, I mean, I think overall, based upon my experience over the last six years watching the land banks, I think you approve it. You let them see what they can do. And if it doesn't go through, it doesn't go through. You know, um, the bank is going to hold them to what we would want them to do anyways. You know, so. So if they can't complete the project, you take the money and, and after two years, you take the lot back. You have to refund the money. We just wouldn't sell it to them. Well, the thing is, if they don't complete the project, the bank doesn't sign off that the bank has a mortgage and they're going to foreclose that first. Yeah, but you get paid at the closing for the $3,000 that you're selling a lot for. Yes. Okay. Um, if after two years they don't complete the project, you just take, you get the lot back or the bank, the bank will keep the lot. The bank is ultimately going to get it because okay. they're right. they're okay. you know in line yeah, first. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And believe it or not, the covenant is going to run with the land, so the bank is going to be stuck with that covenant too. Oh. Okay. And yeah, what I'm hearing is that there's not a lot of risk. I mean, the, the worst outcome is an empty lot is now a partially developed lot, which is not great. But, and then, and then it gets complicated with who knows what the bank is going to do. But that doesn't seem like a, for a reason not to move forward to me. Well, what's going to happen is it's going to be a progress construction loan and then flip into a mortgage, right? So the bank's going to send out their appraisers and they're going to look at the work completed and they're going to watch that schedule, right? So, um, and they're going to want to see the, the cash that the buyer is coming in with uh, to finish the project in the account. And who knows, they may require them to spend that money first or sometimes there's a percentage on the progress where the where the buyer has to put in x percent and the bank will put in for that step of the construction i don't want to get hyper technical with you but that's you know essentially how it works um, and again if they can't make meet the the minimal requirements of coming in with x percent for the project and showing that then the bank's going to decline it at that point anyway um, you know, but the bank basically in these deals makes sure the project does get done just by the nature of how the loan performs. And at that point, to be honest, the project, you know, we can't control that. If they're approved for financing, then it's almost out of our control at that point because we're not the, gonna be the first lien holder anymore. You know, all our covenants and everything are in a second position. And it's really up to the bank to hold their feet to the fire. 
So from a public perspective, at that point, we've done everything that we need to do. Our covenants are there. And if it goes belly up, it's not necessarily, you know, our problem because we we did our due diligence and the bank did too. It just happened, you know. Um, I've not seen a construction uh, go bad. So I think the statistics are pretty good when banks are involved for land banks. Do we have a motion to approve? Well, I think the motion should be um, the sale is, you know, you're going to move to uh, approve the sale to QIMA, Kima, I don't know how that's pronounced. Um, pending additional information showing they have that 11% or, you know, 10% that they're going to need to finance that loan. And then, you know, before I draft a contract and send that over, you know, we want to be able to see that in available funds. If at that point they can't do it. Okay. I'm comfortable with that because yeah. I'll have to provide that information to the lender regardless. Right. Okay. Do we have a motion to approve with that contingency? I'll make it. Okay. Jeanette, are you second? I'll second. All right, so Heather King votes yes. Suzanne Spellin? Yes. Albert Watson? Yes. Andrew Cooper? Yes. Jeanette Nicholson was a second. John Cubitt? Yes. John Carmelo? Yes. Christina Maribel? Yes. Yeah. All in favor, none opposed. <laughs> okay. So next we have a resolution to appoint Mr. Watson to the Acquisition and Disposition Committee. Make a motion to put it on the table for discussion. Are you excited, Albert? <laughs> <laughs> Is that to be on the committee or to be the treasurer? He's already treasurer, so this uh, is to be a member of the A and D committee. Okay, because right, we need to modify the resolution to say appointing Albert. Well, do we need a resolution to yeah. appoint him to the A and D committee? I thought you just joined a committee. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know we needed a resolution. First of hey. all, you you do need a resolution. <laughs> I originally thought it was for treasurer, but Tony reminded me it's for A and D, and I think he changed the resolution I, to A and D. I did, and I yeah. and I thought, oh, I guess I <laughs> I went through a search and find for treasurer, and uh, apparently missed the very first one. And this says October 2020. All okay. right, so let's do this. June, well, June 30th. <laughs> I will revise the resolution that that backs up this vote and you can go ahead and take it. Okay. Yeah, this is yet another example why I should never play attorney. That's all right. <laughs> for, for whatever reason, I had it stuck in my head that we, we still had made him treasurer. Um, but now I do remember we did do that. So let me Not just- like you don't have anything else going on. So the, the motion uh, will be to put Albert Watson on the acquisition and dis disposition committee okay and i'll um, make a i'll make a motion to approve do i have a second no second jeanette um heather king votes yes suzanne spellin yes i don't believe albert can vote andrew cooper yes <laughs> jeanette nicholson made the second john cubitt yes john carmelo yes and christina maribel yes all in favor, yes, none opposed. Welcome, Albert. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for volunteering. <laughs> yes, looking forward to it. Okay, fantastic. You're gonna give him his decoder ring and, and special badge. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, Listen, I would like everybody to come to the a and It's. I think everybody should be. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've got a brand new um, hard hat for Albert, so he's... You didn't give me a hard hat. Are you trying to kill me? You didn't need one. I don't need one. Mm. Okay. So we have the financials. It's not on the agenda, but 
who would like to go over our financials? Is that Albert, Mr. Treasurer? Um, Tony, to. I, I cannot read that thing for the life of me. So I, much as I've tried to understand how to pull out the numbers out of that, I, I, I'm not able to do it. So this well, as of um, May 31st. I'll um, do a quick scenario, synopsis. Um, reported a net loss of 30,000, 41210 on a total revenue of um, 118,705, This is from uh, January 1st to uh, May 31st. Okay. Um, largest expenses were pretty much um, in commercial insurance, uh, outside of Tony's salary, um, accounting, attorney's fees, and administration fees. Um, Tony was at the finance committee meeting. Tony was saying something about um, us getting a grant next month. Right, Tony? Well, it's a disbursement from uh, our uh, enterprise community round four grant. Um, so about two weeks ago, Tanya um, finally threw holy water on my quarterly report and said I could submit for a disbursement. <clears throat> so I did that the next day, <clears throat> pardon me. And, and now Tanya is asking me um, questions that I think really think she should have asked when I um, was submitting my quarterly report. So I need to find out from her where the actual disbursement stands with her accounting department. And there's one question I have to reply back to her about. So um, it's the process I go through every time I do this. So, but the disbursement is for uh, 189. I think uh, just shy of 100, 140, 190 thousand dollars. So, um, and a pretty good chunk of it is funding that we paid out in advance because at the last quarterly report, um, Tanya would not allow me to include as part of the disbursement um, projected funds that would be needed to cover project costs. So, um, so that was a heavy hit to uh, cash flow, and that's actually what precipitated the need for that loan for 11 when you have. Instead, bridge that the lack of financing, the lack of um, disbursements. Yeah, or at least uh, not sufficient. Yeah. Okay. What is the amount we're waiting for? Uh, just shy of 190,000. Oh, wow. Holy smokes. Yeah, so okay. it's, a, it's a good chunk of change. Did we list 11 Winnie yet or no? No, 11, oh God, 11 Winnie um, has been broken into or attempted uh, break-ins four times. So that's that's heartbreaking to me. Yeah, it's very very frustrating. I mean, eleven one eight was ninety nine percent complete, and so someone someone who had the lockbox key walked into the building and took out a kitchen counter and disconnected two dishwashers. So obviously we changed the lockbox code. And the second time someone broke through the back door and walked off with two dishwashers and a refrigerator. Um, the third time. It was another time after that? Yeah, um, but this was just weird. The third time someone took the front of the locks box that held the keys, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> walked into the building and took the keys that were in the lock sets for both entrance doors to the to the units, didn't take anything. I have no idea why they would take the keys. And then um, over the over this past weekend, someone broke a window, but didn't access the building. Uh, and I'm meeting with an insurance adjuster tomorrow morning uh, at 11 when he so. Did we put cameras up? We I've ordered cameras. I've ordered uh, other security devices. They haven't arrived yet. Okay. But yeah, and it's not, so from now on, we'll have some things in place for all our buildings, um, cameras and uh, 
motion detectors that will trigger off a very loud and a very shiny alarm. So that should scare scare anyone off. I don't know. Huh? It sounds like somebody who's got inside knowledge and it's weird. It's a weird, it's not <clears> some <throat> kind of rando, I mean, to go in and take the keys so they can come back anytime they want to take what they want. Well, that was the really weird thing to me because there were four people that had the new code. Uh, me, our broker, um, Brian, our property maintenance guy, and Johnny Bobo, the contractor. Um, so um, Johnny Bobo gave the, the code to his grandson, who's, who works with him every day. And uh, Ryan gave it to uh, someone who's worked with him for years, um, Wayne, um, who, who's, if, if Ryan's on vacation, Wayne takes care of things. So out of those six people, um, I, I, I just don't understand why someone would just decide to walk off with the keys and not take anything else. So it's just, I'm racking my brain for like, okay, I know one of these six people did that and I'm one of those six people, but I can't figure out who did it. Since the building is 99% complete, um, well, now minus dishwashers and refrigerator. Um, is it possible somebody could live in a unit, you know, a, a security guard type person, mm -hmm. just so that there's a, a presence in the building, lights go on and off, um, people can- Well, we, we don't have a CO, so there's that. Um, it's so not uncommon, I hate to say it, that things like this happen. Yeah, Norm, no, normally, it um, they break in to take copper pipes and wires and things like that because of the value of it. Um, yeah, this is weird. This what they're taking is weird. You know the the issue is to once you have realtors who use lock boxes. Um, if someone wanted another realtor was representing somebody who wanted to see the property you know, and they're given the code and then the person watches them put the code in. I mean, there's all sorts of variations on this, um, but we definitely need to secure our properties better. Um, and, uh, you know, overnight that's tough without on-site monitoring, you know, of the, of the premises, but, you know, it's unfortunate, but it's happened before with land bank properties, not ours, but others. Yeah, I just find it unusual. I've I've heard about it in those situations when there's the codes more actively out there. I just think it's odd that it's such a limited. It, it's just it's just strange. Somebody needed to finish their building. So they yeah, stealing a refrigerator, like and two dishwashers and, work a, and a, what, what did you get out of that? A refrigerator. <laughs> Two, and two dishwashers. And, di and, and two uh, dishwashers. Like, can you fence a, a dishwasher? I mean, yes, <laughs> like, you can. Well, I, I mean, I know you can, but we'll have to go on Facebook Marketplace the, to see if it's the, on there. Uh, yeah, the return on investment there is, is slim. <laughs> it's crazy. All right, did we need to go into executive attorney client privilege, or was that just on there? I wasn't sure if Kate wanted it, so I, I always put it on there just in case, in case Kate. Kate, is there anything that we need to discuss and privilege? Not that I, not that I have, no. Okay. okay, so next month is our meeting in person. Yeah, so yeah, from here on out, committee meetings and uh, of course the board meeting will be in person. Of course, so we're, so we're, we're looking at normal. July 21st at 8.30. Yeah. I have to uh, reserve the room, the conference room at City Hall. Um, so I'll, I'll call to do that and set it up for the year. Next I'm the year. very excited to see everybody in person. You get to see me in person. What? <laughs> right now. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> um, I think too, if you can, Tony, find out if there's any protocols at City Hall still. You know, they may yeah. make us wear masks until we get to the room. I don't know, but we just want to be prepared for that. Uh, yeah. Why they may just, not let us even in there, who knows? Yeah, I'm sure when I go out to try to do the reservation, if anything, I, I'll ask, but I'm sure 
they would say so. Okay, we'll find out. Yeah. Definitely find out. Well, everybody have a wonderful three weeks until we see you again. Yeah. So we're gonna make a motion to adjourn 9.37. Our second. All right, Suzanne. All right, everybody, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed and want to stay on longer? <laughs> so, all uh, right. I'll see everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Hey, Tony.